Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. And please check out getitinwriting.net forward slash shows for a full list of our podcasts and YouTube series. My guest is engineer extraordinaire and pro audio ninja Stephen Miller. How's that? Does that work? Okay. All right. We, you'll accept those, right? I'll accept that. Okay. You do definitely have a wide and um, non-sequential career path. <laughs> so we'll touch on some high notes first. Um, uh, one of the founding fathers of Wyndham Hill and the, uh, the genre associated with it. We'll, and we, we, we'll leave that unnamed. Uh, uh, a thousand elevators, thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot of work with Steve Jobs on some of the original uh, sounds of Macintoshia or Mac. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah? We, uh, yeah. The, the three products that were basically developed um, uh, 2E, Lisa, and, <clears throat> and Steve's baby, uh, the Macintosh. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, um, well, a whole bunch of recordings, you know, those, those, those things we do, those you know, do. Uh, and then uh, work with Alan Sides on a number of libraries of sorts and uh, uh, things that have been used all over, <clears throat> all over music, yes. hither and yon. Yeah. So um, let's start at the very beginning. All right. Are you, did you uh, go the typical uh, musician? path where you started playing music and then you walked into the studio and were enamored with all the blinkies and... Well, <clears throat> I mean, I was a musician uh, and even by the time I was 13, 14, I, I mean, I was a working musician <clears throat> playing sometimes uh, four to five gigs a weekend. By the Fake time birth I... certificates so you could get into <clears throat> the clubs? And... Well, <clears throat> uh, like everybody had a, a rock band that that went, you know, as as the time went on, went from being, you know, rock band playing, you know, Beatles and Zeppelin tunes to then jazz rock as that as that started uh, happening. Uh, but also one of the great things, besides playing rock and and jazz tunes, you know, modern jazz as I got into it, was that my original guitar teacher, and this is New Jersey, New York. Uh, old, you know, older Italian guy, Johnny D, Johnny D DeVito. Of course. Um, <clears throat> uh, and he made his living besides teaching, <clears throat> playing weddings, bar mitzvahs, that sort of thing. So <clears throat> starting really kind of for me in 1969, uh, yes, I'm that old, um, he started taking me <clears throat> around on this, the gigs with him and his friends in tuxedos playing, you know, uh, society, you know, the, the tunes of uh, an older time, of our parents' kind of tunes that... Uh, Frank Sinatra, <clears throat> Lawrence Welk, et cetera. That kind of stuff. Uh -huh. And then uh, I would play, <clears throat> I'd be out in my Paisley shirt and uh, play the rock tunes. But one of the great things about doing that was... <clears throat> when they would go and play, you know, be playing <clears throat> their Tin Pan Alley stuff, their, uh, I'd be off to the side and off stage. And I went, well, I might as well be learning these tunes. <clears throat> so whether I was playing bass or I had a bass or a guitar, I, <clears throat> by, you know, by ear, kind of sit there <clears throat> and listen and, and learn these songs. So you weren't turned off by these being the older generation. No, because... Music. I mean, I originally got in, I mean, fell in love with music by seeing Fantasia and, and seeing Mary Poppins uh -huh. and um, Sound of Music, you know, and that existed, you know, pre-64 and, and for younger people. Pre-Beatles. Pre-February, I think it's 9th, 1964, when the Beatles showed up mm -hmm. uh, on the Ed Sullivan Show. So I, and I had gone to see there was a thing that Leonard Bernstein, the, the, the great composer and <clears throat> conductor of the New York Philharmonic, he did these series called Music for Little People. Yes. 
and <clears throat> it was shown on, on television, and I got to go to uh, one of them at, at, Car at Carnegie Hall, uh, <clears throat> and he explained um, uh, Peter and the Wolf and, and all this stuff. So I was already enthralled by symphony orchestra, by you know show music, and also, again, growing up <clears throat> in, right outside of New York City, would get taken to Broadway shows. So we've seen West Side Story, West Side Story, uh -huh. revival of Guys and Dolls. Sure. Um, and so by the time you know the Beatles came, um, you know it was the Beatles uh, early on. You know it was yeah, it was three chord rock. It was <clears throat> it was um, you know Little Richard taking you know that thing, Chuck Berry, Little Richard. But <clears throat> as the Beatles you know got on. There was plenty of stuff that sounded, you know, like wow, the, the Sherman Brothers could have been <clears throat> writing this. Uh, this is stuff that's as, you know, as melodic, and through composed as uh, Broadway show music. Sure. So, <clears throat> you know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't turned off by it. You know, I didn't feel like, oh, <clears throat> you know, Sinatra, like, you know, he seemed like, you know, that's that's another that my parents' generation. But then when I started really listening to the tunes and then realizing, oh my God, you know, here are these tunes and I would hear on <clears throat> WOR, we both know WOR from, <clears throat> that sure. was our parents, the, the adults, John Gambling, the rambling with gambling. <clears throat> and WNEW AM w as well. W mm -hmm. AM. Yes. So you realize, oh my God, these are the songs that Ella Fitzgerald was singing, and uh -huh. <clears throat> and Frank Sinatra, and Nat King Cole, and then you'd hear Billie Holiday, and <clears throat> so for me, getting into you know, for me, I, I I had a special affinity in rock for when I heard the blues-based stuff for Hendrix, Zeppelin, <clears throat> Clapton, Cream for Jeff Beck, um, but I also like got was into that that stuff and going, oh my God, you know, Ella Fitzgerald, fantastic. Billie Holiday, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And Nat King Cole really was my favorite singer. And then learning, then when I got into Ray Charles, it was like, oh, Ray Charles, his favorite singer <clears throat> was Nat King Cole. So I started off, I just thought that's what I was going to do. And, but I, at the same time, I started getting completely infatuated with records and when when I would do these gigs and I do four or five gigs a weekend I would take all the money I made <clears throat> and I take the train in to Manhattan on Tuesday and I go to Sam Goody's and, <clears throat> and of course I, you would. Would, I would basically <laughs> spend 80 percent of <clears throat> what I made from the gigs on records and I had built up uh, up until I started giving records away I built up a 10,000 plus record collection. Didn't move much, did you? I've moved a lot. <laughs> and though it cost a lot to move those records. Um, and again, records in those days, <clears throat> if you remember the, at Sam Goody's and at Corvette's, because they had different tiers of the prices, they would slash the plastic and yep. write the price, you know, and the price of records at that point was 98 cents, a dollar 29. It got up to a dollar 98. It was wow, shit. Whoa. This is this is yeah. this is expensive. And then when they had double albums, oh man. Oh like, my God, Wheels uh, of Fire. Four or five bucks. Wheels, oh my God. Small Wheels fortune. of Fire, uh, I mm -hmm. think, was one of my first, uh, you know, uh, double albums or you know, Beatles White album. Uh, so I I became infatuated with how the sounds of these records are so different. I figured out already, okay, well, you know, a Stratocaster can sound a million different ways depending on, on the kind of amps they're in. I get mm -hmm. that. I get guitar sounds are different because they're, they're all different. But how does a band with a Stratocaster and a Fender amp or a Stratocaster and a Marshall amp, a drummer, bass, and a keyboard sound so different record to record? And even when you look and go, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a Columbia record. They recorded it <clears throat> at 30th Street at the Columbia Record Studio. So how does this record with the same instrumentation in the same studio sound so completely different? And while I'm, I'm learning music, I'm, I'm getting infatuated with that. 
and, and asking questions Recordings. of older people. And, and again, the advantage of, as you well know, growing up uh, you know, in or right outside of a giant city and New York City was I would go in and I was almost this size when I was 13 and 14. And I would be, the club owners, the jazz club owners would let me in. So <clears throat> I got to meet the guys, the studio players who became like the next generation of like jazz rock players, the Brecker brothers, Don Grolnick, Steve Kahn, Steve Gadd, <clears throat> mm -hmm. you know, and I would, and I knew that they were the studio players too. So I would go, well, why is this? I would just be asking questions, 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 questions. So you had not been in a studio by this point? Or had you? I got into a studio, um, and it's amazing that the first studio and the first engineer I had any contact with just happened to be Phil Ramone. <clears throat> that there was start small, yeah. That there was a all-star New Jersey, New York, <clears throat> Connecticut uh, band, and uh, that was put together, and we got to go and record uh, at A and R. And I knew when they said, hey, this is Mr. Ramon that's going to record, I knew his name from, from album liner notes. Of course. Uh -huh. And especially like a live thing. I don't know if, if you remember this. Uh, in 1970, Elton John did <clears throat> on, on WNEWFM did a, a live recording that yes. became the, the whatever, 11, 10, 70. It was named for the date it for was the, recorded, as I recall, yeah. <clears throat> you know, mm -hmm. and, and Phil Ramon, and I had the Paul Winter record, I had, you know, these, uh, ja these jazz records. Phil had a, a label called Solid State. Sure. Uh, recorded some of the best, you know, the Joe Beam record with Stan Getz. I, like, shit my pants. And they said, don't go in, you don't go into this, to the control room. And I, like, was just like, oh so my god! So of course you went into the. Control. I went in, and I, and like I was being quiet, but then I saw Phil Ramone on the on the sixteen track. It was you know sixteen track was new, Ooh. and he was rewinding, but then hitting the hitting you know go rewind stuff. And I said, hey, now it's interesting. Are, are you doing that because if you just hit stop? The torque would like stop the machine, and this big tape would. Rip, and the the leader of the band said, "Oh, you're not supposed to be in here." And Phil turned to me and said, "What's your name?" And I told him. That he said, "That's a very bright question." He said, "Yes, that is the reason." And at that point, I, I you, could, you didn't have to leave anymore. <laughs> I didn't have to leave. So my and and the, the second place I ever was was Rudy Van Gelder's studio. I, as, as well, a, you didn't mess around, did as you? As a 16-year-old, you know, I got to play on <clears throat> on somebody's record, and it was at, at Van Gelder's. So, yeah, I, I thought that was the coolest fucking place you could be. And I also, as a musician, knew two things. I I, I got to to audition for one of my idols bands, and I realized, like, I, I sucked. It, I, I, it just was an awful thing. I, you know, it, we, we call it ham-fisted, when suddenly, you're, you know, you're used to your mm -hmm. hand going like this, and then it just becomes a claw, and you can't do anything. Um, and I realized that I didn't love playing in a live environment. You know, I, people were noisy and stuff. It's like, I like the art of trying for perfection. That's what got me off. It's like sitting, you know, and all of us sitting on our bed learning. Uh, and it's very solitary. And there's no bullshit. There's no, <clears throat> like, mm -hmm. people yelling. People, it's like you, you can't fake it. You're crafting something. And I went, oh, I, I get it. That's what I like. I like the crafting of music without any side bullshit. Um, <clears throat> mm -hmm. And I still, like, realize, it's funny, when I work with Dave Matthews, and I, and I joke with, with, <clears throat> with Dave about something, I said, you know, you could be sucking, and you have people that are your fans, and you could just start jumping around, and it's like, and people are going crazy, and it's like, you, you could actually be playing the worst shit possible, and you could get away with that. And to me, it's like, no, I don't want any part of that. I, I wanted, Interesting. I wanted 
<clears throat> I wanted to be. You wanted perfection. Wanted you know to, as good as as anything could be. Mm -hmm. So. It, so it, you're very analytical then, is what it comes down yeah, to. Yeah. 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 I, I, uh -huh. I've always been mm -hmm. anally analytical. <clears throat> you know, uh, it's, uh, some the artists that I've produced over the years, you know, would call it. You know, th that would be a polite way of <clears throat> saying <laughs> what, because I used to drive people crazy. I mean, I and and where rock critics would say, "Oh, Steely Dan, that's too perfect," you know, and would get on them, and I go, "That's what I want." If I had the kind of budgets that <clears throat> Donald and Walter had, I would have, you know, I would have had people, you know, playing shit as as much as they did, you know, mm -hmm. over and over and over and over. Um, and I probably was, uh, over the years, you know, too perfect and trying for that. Sometimes, you know, the artists just say, you know, kind of give me the finger and go, you know, that's kind of it, you know. But mm -hmm. um, then they come back and go, yeah, all right, I'll go with you. you know? mm -hmm. So yes, as a musician, and I, and I never stopped it. I mean, I was, I, the the engineering part for me has always been secondary. You know, when when Wyndham Hill became popular, and I got you know the first engineering uh, Grammy nomination for Michael Hedges, um, people here, you know, they thought, oh well, you're an engineer that's that's just producing. And I go, no, 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 the engineering. And I remember <clears throat> when I first met Al Schmidt, and this was uh, pre Wyndham Hill. I was working for Malcolm Cecil. Oh wow. Uh, here in Los Angeles, I, right after San Francisco State, uh, I, had, I was working for a lot of the producers in San Francisco while I was going to, to college. Yes, we've discussed this previously, that we are both San Francisco State alumni. And oh. mm -hmm. so Bernie Krause, I was working for him, Bernie uh -huh. in introduced me to, to Malcolm, and, <clears throat> and I came down here um, to L.A. Uh, to work for Malcolm, and... Um, I met Al, God, you know, a few, I don't know, about two or three months after I was working with uh, with Malcolm, and you know, and uh, and I said, yeah, I'm I'm a producer. I'm you know, I'm learning to you know, kind of getting the engineering thing down because I have a, an aesthetic, a, a sonic aesthetic that I really wanted to to get at, and I and, and I couldn't explain it to other people. I realized I have to to be the one actually doing this stuff, you mm -hmm. know, and the, that aesthetic was what, you know, I think I developed at Wyndham Hill, where it's this, this thing, this big, larger than life sonic setting. You know, I, I at, that, at that point, uh, I had fallen in love with the sound of ECM records from, <clears throat> from Europe, and I thought, you know, it's a, it, those records were just so luscious and gorgeous, and up to that point, instrumental records, whether it was jazz or folk, um, it usually, okay, it's a guitar record or piano record or a jazz record, you set the, 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 the mix, and it's that way exactly the, for every single tune. And I went, nah, that doesn't work for me. I, I wanted to bring something else and bring, you know, at, by that point, People like Bob Clearmountain were, were bringing this amazing aesthetic to, to rock and pop records where each tune sounded very different. Sure. You know, one tune, okay, it's, it's very tight, but then there's a slap echo on the vocal, and then you know, the guitars are set way out, and another tune, it's, it's really ambient, and then the, the, the vocal is dry. And to me, it's like, wow, that's really interesting. It makes... <clears throat> The, the music more compelling than it even is. And <clears throat> I went, okay, I'm gonna need to do that hands-on as an engineer on top of my production concept and my musical concepts. Now, now that's interesting because you really, um, in many ways, you tread that gray area between producer and engineer. Well, I, I oh, you know, yes, but I always was I mean, when, when the guidance counselor in ninth grade said, what are you going to do? And I, and I said, I'm going to be a record producer. <clears throat> um, you know, and that was early on. I, I, you know, I knew I was going to be a musician, mm -hmm. but I knew at that point, you know, 
musician, composer, arranger, you know, and that, and that was early on where, where, you know, you looked at sometimes it said A&R on the yeah, record. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it didn't even say producer. A, the artist and repertoire director yes. was the producer. You're building a sonic landscape. And, and that, I think, is what's... There are engineers and there are engineers in that sense. There are engineers who are much more attuned to the technical parameters of, you know, whatever it is a, a piece of gear does, as opposed to seeing the big picture musically and engineering from that aspect. Yeah, no, and, and, and uh, you know, <clears throat> a lot of my mutual friends, you know, who are great engineers, but not <clears throat> musicians or the, m music wasn't there. Mm -hmm. they, they, they didn't, it's, a, it's a totally different thing. And, and my, <clears throat> my pal of, you know, 40 some odd years, Alan Sides, Alan comes to it from a different place. I, I would uh, think so. Yeah. Um, and there were, and he was always kind of baffled about like you're making these choices. I'm going. He said those are interesting engineering choices, and I would say, well, they're not engineering choices. They're musical choices, and it's always been that's always been the deal for me. It's I look at <clears throat> at the the colors that I was trying to achieve. With with all the echoes and delays, as as in, that they were as important as my arrangement. Yeah, the studio is your instrument in that sense. And you know, so for a lot of the Wyndham Hill stuff, when I would arrange for you know a cello and an oboe and a you know English horn with a guitar and and this and it's like okay, I've got this, but I already knew okay, I want I I don't want this to sound like a, a traditional let's say chamber group where it's it's. That I want the <clears throat> the oboe to be in this kind of space and 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 this in a different kind of space with the reverb being more detailed on the bottom end. That's so interesting. It, it was, yeah, and um, that's very global. And when people have looked, especially over the last let's say twenty five years since I've been back, mainly <clears throat> in in Los Angeles because I had retired for a while and then came back and moved back to, to California uh, almost 25 years ago. And <clears throat> when a lot of the assistants, and I didn't want to do that thing that people wanted me to do, oh, let, can you give me that Wyndham Hill sound? You know, can I sound, I want my guitar to sound just like Michael Hedges. And it's like, yeah, I nah, did that already. Did it, but yeah. when <clears throat> a bunch of the assistants would see me do my reverb thing, they go, how did you figure that out? And I, you know, and even Alan would say, I don't know where that came from. And I, I figured it out because I had to figure out a way for it to make, to sound like the way I want it to sound. So a lot of those records, <clears throat> George Winston, Liz Story, Degrassi, all those things where I developed that reverb sound, which most people thought I was using, you know, four or five different reverbs. I realized early on, and it was just trial and error, and I remember talking to people like Alan, like, <clears throat> like Al Schmidt, like George Massenberg, like Bruce Botnick. I said, you know, if you use too many of these reverbs, they, they start smearing and you, and, you get, <clears throat> and you get a phase issue. Mm -hmm. And I, I had figured that out not as clearly. I figured it doesn't sound as good. It, does, it sounds big, but I, I'm getting but these it's things. washy. Washy and Al said, eh, "Yeah, it's phase." <laughs> I remember him saying this to me forty some years ago. Yeah, Steve, it's it's phase. And yep. I, oh, okay. I get that's it. A very good. That's a very good impression of Al there. Huh? Yeah. Um, and so what I figured out, I want all these different feels. So what I did, and this is, I'm letting in you know anybody who's heard those records, I started taking different delays and tape delays. And I would, I would filter them and EQ them uh, all differently. And so they sound very, very different. Just the, the tone of them is completely different. One, I filter you know, just the bottom. I wouldn't have anything uh, above you know, uh, 500 mm -hmm. than others up here. So they're all in different ranges. And they're all at different delay times. 
and I'm putting those, none of those are using, are being dry. You're not hearing the dry delay. I'm putting them into one reverb. Into a reverb. And I'm uh -huh. sometimes setting the, <clears throat> if I've got a piano and I've got, you know, uh, an echo that's, that's left to right, I would take the echo for this side, put it over here, stuff that's bouncing, and they're bouncing at different delay times with different frequency ranges. And then if you take something like, if I was using a PCM 41 or 42, and you have a mix control, so not only do I have, I can put in a little bit of the original dry signal, the same as the whatever the, the reverb setting, delay setting to is. To get the attack and everything and, and keep it clear. Yeah. So uh -huh. suddenly, that's how people thought, like, wow, he's using 10 different reverbs. This stuff is flying all over the place. It's just a bunch of different delays to the reverb. Into, but, uh -huh. but it's not just the delays. They're all sonically in their totally own Totally different, yeah. Place. Mm -hmm. And I would experiment with that. And I was like, that's what I'm trying to hear. And it was basically taking the ECM thing times a thousand. So did you hear this in your head? I yes. mean, did you know what you were going for? Yeah, because what I was going for was when I was a little kid, the first time I went to Carnegie Hall, and I heard <clears throat> this explosion of the orchestra, and, and I was turning around, and, and each place where I was putting my ears, I was hearing things, delays uh -huh. and slaps uh -huh. and stuff, and going, whoa! Especially in a complex environment like, like a concert hall like Carnegie Hall. Yeah. Sure. And, and I went, I don't know what that was. I, it's, I, it's interesting that you picked up on all that, though. Oh, yeah. I, I had no idea what, what, you know, that's called reflection times and, and stuff. I mm -hmm. didn't know. I just knew it was, it was so amazing and that you could walk back, like I, I would <laughs> walk to the back of the hall saying, I got to go to the bathroom and just want to hear the difference <laughs> of like, wow, it sounds so different. And the balance of the orchestra or the ensemble changed as I moved back. I was like, wow. So suddenly there's this place where I'm hearing the violins more than I did up front, mm -hmm. but I'm not hearing the clarinets as much. And going, whoa. Again, I didn't understand that, like what that was, the basics of, of, of acoustics. I learned it later. But your analytical side was already kicking in. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. So that's, you know, uh, that's how, you know, the building of, I guess, what people started calling the, the Wyndham Hill mm -hmm. sound and, and my, my shtick of, of having the stuff you know, fly all over the place. So you really only needed one reverb, but you needed a whole bunch of different delays. Yeah. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you know, and then when and I... filters. Then when I you know, uh, started adding that to, to rock and pop you know, things, I you know, was using <clears throat> more reverbs for different, you know, for different instruments. But... Mm -hmm. Um, for a lot of the instrumental stuff, you know, that, that's how I did it. You know, and, and the other thing was why I think, you know, people ask, how did those records, traditionally a, a solo piano record or solo guitar record, whether it's jazz or folk, would sell 5,000 copies, you know, and people said, how did that thing build where, you know, the December George Winston record Worldwide, I think at this point is almost six million copies, you know, and and you know, the stuff was just selling ten to a hundred times more than any kind of records of those of that sort in the mm -hmm. past, and it was very very conscious for me that not only do I make this this aesthetic, this very deep musical aesthetic that I had in my head, but that each tune had a different sound. And I did a lot of this live to two track. Did you really? A lot of those records, Michael Hedges, Aerial Boundaries, when really? when uh -huh. when Sony wanted to when Sony owned the the Wind the Mill catalog and they wanted to do a 30th or 25th anniversary, uh, you know, reissue, make a big huge thing, and the same thing with George Winston's December. I said, they said you can remix it, and I went. I can't no, remix can't. it. It's, it's, it's done. Uh -huh. And and I had these people from from the A and R uh, administration department saying, no, no, it's got all the, this this one young woman at Sony, 
bless her heart, she said, I went to what's the, the recording school on University Place uh, in Manhattan. The, oh, uh, uh, our... Whatever that's, yeah, yeah, I, whatever yeah, that's yeah. that school. She said, mm -hmm. no, I went to, I w got a degree at that place. I'm hearing all the, the reverbs that you did. And she said, that, obviously that, that has, that's a mix. And I said, well, sorry to disappoint you. I did that, all that live. And she didn't believe me, and they pulled the tapes. And it's like, yeah, it's live to two track. And I went, you know, part wow. of it was I, from tune to tune, I would just, I would get the vibe and go, okay, this is very different. It's a quicker tempo, so I can't put the, the kind of length I want. Mm -hmm. um, and it's got a very different vibe. So those things, I think, were made more interesting. And again, I, 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 I just equated to what I was getting when I would hear what Bob Clear Mountain in specifically was doing on some, like the In Excess records and, and the Big Bam Boom uh -huh. of Hall & Oates where it was like, wow, each tune is so freaking different and it makes, it just makes it even more amazing, you know, especially if you've got great music that's, wow, it's so different and it, you're bringing something so completely different to the listener from tune to tune. You're really focusing on the song. Yeah, and, and a lot, you know, and it's funny, hate to you know keep on bringing Al up, but Al was such an ins inspiration for for s most of us. Mm -hmm. um, but Al used to say, yeah, a, a record, a jazz record, it was almost sacrilegious to fuck with it. It was like, you, you get it, and if you want to put a little reverb, okay, that's the vibe of the record, but that's it. Mm -hmm. it, it you, so it doesn't get to feel like you're fucking around with this art. Well, and who are we to... You know, and that's, that's you know, the age-old esoteric question. Who are we to alter an artist's sound? Well, well yeah, and, and, and it's interesting. I, look, I'm a guy who was... I, I was not a passive producer. Mm -hmm. It was like, Clearly. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm adding my Clearly. shit. yeah. And uh, there are guys who said, yeah, I mean, you were, I was duetting with the artists on a, on a lot of that stuff. Um, and... And, and I say it unabashedly. I'm, I'm, you know, there was some stuff where I, I went, okay, I'm not going to fuck with it and, and really add that much of my thing. But a lot of them, it's like, yeah, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm I'm an arranger, and I'm I'm adding my thing, my sonic imprint, and and my my musicality to it, and um, you know, and that's that's what I did. It's interesting because you know, there's a lot of different schools of thought in in production. You know, you go from the uh, the be invisible, do no harm yeah. type of producer to, and and they can very well, as you say, they could be the same person depending on the project. But you know, you've you've got someone like that, and then you've got people who, you know, uh, now Clear Mountain's a great example because he's done so many different things. Yet he does have a sonic fingerprint of his yeah. own. Um, someone like uh, Mutt Lang, you know, you know a Mutt Lang record, right? In, in ten seconds, right. you know. But and you know, my and my my heroes, and I came up w when the guys who I really wanted to emulate were producer arrangers. Uh huh. Dave sure. Grusin, and Phil Ramone. F Phil Ramone. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, uh, and I learned a lot from those guys. You know, and um, and even though Tommy Lapuma was not a an arranger. Came from that. He was that, a music guy, that, though. That school. Yeah. And so, um, I look at it more, you know, from a musical standpoint. And I'm adding. I always said I'm adding this this sonic aesthetic to my musical aesthetic, and and I look at it as one. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it's interesting. That's how the connection with Apple and Steve Jobs came along, because Steve... Nice segue. That's where I wanted to go. Very Steve <laughs> was, was obsessed with, with what we were doing at Wyndham Hill. And, and people have to remember or learn, in 83, Apple was at a teetering point. They were, if, if they didn't have a hit product, they were going to go out of business. Was that the era when Microsoft pumped money into them, or no? no. I'm the, unclear on that history. The, this was a point where <clears throat> it, it was shit or get off the pot, and um, and at that point, Wyndham Hill was on a 
much higher trajectory as a, as a company in Silicon Valley uh -huh. than Apple. Apple was like, okay, at, at this point, and they were going to make three products, which became the 2E after the Apple II, the Lisa, which was the most expensive home computer, you know, at, you, six grand in, in 30, 40 years ago. What would six grand, you know, it's really expensive. And as people who are computer nuts know, it, that bombed. Mm. And the Macintosh was the, you know, the holy grail. It did okay. Yeah. And, um, and Steve had these two things, these aesthetics. Steve was, was obsessed with Dr. Land. And people who don't know Dr. Dr. Land was Polaroid. He invented the Land camera, mm -hmm. the, the instant camera. And he was obsessed with that. In fact, the Apple logo is based on Polaroid <clears throat> logo. He was ah, never he, thought of that. You're absolutely right. And sure. And and he loved what <clears throat> what we were doing. He wanted that aesthetic. So um, f the music that w accompanied these these computers, like everyone got a tape, and 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 to explaining you know how to how to make the Apple computers work. It was all our, our stuff. And then uh, the sounds that we were developing or work with Steve on. And then, of course, the original com commercials. It was stuff that, that me and Andy Norell wrote and, and, and produced and uh, engineered. And um, you know, I spent a lot of time with, with Steve. Um, uh, you know, and, and they were amazing, if, if you remember these commercials. I mean, Ridley Scott, you know, one of the great filmmakers. I think Taylor Hackford did, did some of these. These were groundbreaking things. Um, Kevin Costner, one of the first things he ever did was uh, early commercial. I, I remember years ago, someone said, hey, I got this, this, this early Apple commercial that you did. And I didn't even realize the guy in it was a young Kevin Costner. Wow. Uh, you know, and one of one of the funniest, my f one of my f I've had plenty of funny episodes in my career, but I got to say one of the funniest times was in a meeting with Steve and um, a few other people, and we were talking about something, and I said, Steve, I've got this great idea, blah 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 blah, blah. and everyone knows at this point Steve was a tough cookie, and he could be freaking brutal. And he looked at me and he goes, that's the worst fucking idea I've ever heard in my life. Ow. Oh, no. no. <laughs> Steve and I spent time, we, mm -hmm. we would listen to records, we have, uh -huh. have, have dinner. And I looked at him and I went, if that's the worst idea you've ever heard, you're the luckiest motherfucker on the face of this planet. <laughs> now... The other people in the room were like, oh my God, you know, he's going to throw Stephen Miller out of the room. Steve just kind of looked slyly. And I couldn't believe he let it go. But in those days, I, I used to fly, like every week I was flying between New York, <clears throat> LA, the Bay Area constantly. And, and at the end of that meeting, I had dinner and then I, I took the night flight back to New York. And when I got there after the night flight, it was usually by the time I got home, it was within 15 to 30 minutes of the first the, uh, FedEx delivery. Uh -huh. So I'm still, I, I got home, I'm saying hi to, to my wife before she goes to work. And FedEx, oh, we got an early FedEx. I open, I see it's from, it's from Cupertino. I open it up and it says, Dear Steve, upon further reflection, your idea is still the stupidest fucking idea I've ever seen. <laughs> Love and respect, Steve. And it was so perfect of that guy because Had to frame that man. <laughs> well, unfortunately, that when when there was the uh, app, the Steve Jobs documentary, the filmmakers called me and said, "We've heard about that whole thing. Do you have?" That and I said I did. Unfortunately, I had a huge um, storage area in West Beth in New York, and when when Hurricane Sandy happened, it flooded. Oh. So I had like 20 boxes of stuff, 
I've, I've got a great, um, uh, probably the only thing I still have is a, a, a letter saying, oh, we want uh, to set up a, a production schedule for the next bunch of, of um, uh, Apple commercials. And it said, you know, like usual, this product is top secret. Now, my ex-wife was a shrink. So she thought every, oh, she said, oh, these people are, are you know, so self-important. Like, th this thing you're doing, like, it's, it's going to change the world. And I remember looking at this going, oh, yeah, this, this top secret thing that my ex-wife thought was so self-important. It's called the Macintosh. It did change the fucking world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that was, that was sometimes fun times with Steve who, if anybody who was working for Steve, like, was an employee, said, you know, stuff like that, oh, he'd bite their head off. But me and Will Ackerman, it this had is a special a, position. We, we just had, sense. you know, he uh -huh. loved, you know, Will took him up to meet, uh, to go, uh, uh, kayaking with the guys from the Grateful Dead, you know, and, uh -huh. and you know, I, I took him to meet Michael Hedges, and you know, so there was a different, a different thing going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you were the celebrity connection. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it, it was, it was, we had, we had some crazy, crazy fun. Uh huh. Um, so yeah, um, and then, uh, gosh, you know, where do, where do you want to go next? I, I've, well, where did you go next? Because that, that then started evolving into a whole different type of career well in that you know sense. i was when i left windham hill i shortly became vice president at rca records which i did not like um shocking i, I it was the wrong place it was you know the company you know at that point rca really was the weak sister i i would have had a much better time uh, staying, because Wyndham Hill be, became part of A&M, and mm -hmm. you got spoiled. If you worked for any part of, of A&M and were around the A&M lot... Was the label. You, you, yeah. <clears throat> you got spoiled. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only thing that was close to that was <clears throat> the country club feel you know, in Burbank at Warner's, but it was different at, at Warner Brothers Records because you weren't on a lot. You weren't running into people. Sure. Um, you know, when I recorded the first bunch of stuff for Michael Hedges' famous Aerial Boundaries record, the, the, uh, the, there was a lunch truck that came, that was always uh, on the A&M lot. And I'm standing there and I realized that Andy Summers is behind me. And Andy and I were talking, and I said, you gotta come back up to my office. Like, there's this guy he said, yeah, oh, that guy, you know, Herb Alpert told me about that guy. I said, have you heard any of the stuff? He goes, no. I said, I'm, so me and Andy Summers are you know, eating enchiladas, and he's literally going, holy shit. He said, how many tracks is this? I go, no, Andy, it's a solo guitar. You know, and it, you got to, you know, people started hearing, oh, Andy Summers is in Stephen Miller's office, and people running up, and, you know, my God, it, it was, you got... You definitely got spoiled. So by the time I'm at RCA here in, in New York, it was like, nah, this, this, this bites. Did you also find that you were typecast? Well, I, I was, you know, and, and I wanted to, to get untypecast because I was offered at the same time to start a division for MCA. Um, and Tommy LaPuma had left Warners at that point, and I talked to Mo, you know, about basically starting, you know, taking his division and <clears throat> putting my kind of stuff in there. Uh, you know, I had, and I had those discussions. Um, partially, I was a bit arrogant thinking, yeah, you know, I think I might want to do that in five or ten years, you know, when other people like Herb Alpert said, see, you, you get opportunity when you get opportunity. Yeah, hello. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, I was so fortunate that I got that level of success so early that I, I kind of, you know, it went, I just thought, yeah, no, that's just for regular people. For me, I'll, I'll make the rules, my own rules, because I'm so heavy. And it's like... Bit of hubris there, huh? Yeah, yeah, not a bit. Uh, like, a shitload. Uh -huh. um, 
so I, I did some records for Dave Grusin and Larry Rosen. Dave was a, you know, an idol of mine. And then I, I, I just wanted to do more rock and pop and, and folk stuff. And in between those things, worked on some movies. Uh, and then by the time I got back here to LA, uh, I was doing a whole bunch of stuff, you know, like rock, pop, working on kids, uh, Jonas Brothers, you know, it was like, whoa, okay, that's, that's as far from, you know, uh, Michael Brecker and Don Grolnick as you can get. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But it was like, okay, I'm applying my, my trade and, and kind and of- And you were able to successfully do that. Yeah. Because a lot of times, you know, no, no, when, you're, I, when you're pigeonholed like that, you really, you don't get those opportunities. Yeah. You know, I, I think part of it was uh, some people said, okay, one of the things that I was willing to do, which I hadn't been in the past, was engineer things that I wasn't producing. I, mm. In the past, it was like, no, you know, if you want, uh, you know, I'm, I'm producing mainly, but, you know, I, and, and I'm fine with working with other engineers, but usually the budget was, okay, you, you do it all. Um, so this was, was this budgetary or was this because you were a control freak? Uh, both. You know, I mean, there were, there were some things that I did uh, work Manhattan Transfer and st stuff in New York where um, I worked with Jim Boyer, who, who came along uh, at A&R with Phil Ramone. He was the next guy after Elliot Shiner. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and um, so I uh, and did all the Billy Joel records and stuff. So I uh, did some, some of my productions. I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm arranging all this stuff. I'm, I'm actually playing some guitar on it. I need, I, I can't be sitting at the, at the console. I've got too much stuff to, to deal with. Was um, it easy for you to let go? And no, it, it, was, it was fine. It was fine. Okay. And I also knew that I wasn't going to be adding my sonic aesthetic to those records. It, mm -hmm. it was more okay. I'm adding my musical aesthetic. I'm I'm, I'm writing arrangements. And you were okay with that. Yeah, okay. and and mm -hmm. these are records that are going to sound. It it doesn't need my schmutz all over it, <laughs> it you know. Mm -hmm. um, even though one or two songs, it would be like, uh, I remember <laughs> Ahmed Erdogan on Janice Siegel's solo record, uh, and and Ahmed and I had talked about uh, if I would come to Atlantic and start, you know. A Stephen Miller type sub label, and, <laughs> and we're listening to to the Janis Siegel solo record, and Amit was great. You know, he listening to records with with Amit was great. He'd get really into it, and he goes, uh, you know, and I, I can't do a good Amit imitation, but he said that tune, that could use your windmill schmutz on it. <laughs> uh, and I said that's that very like funny. I thought yeah. you didn't want. You know, he goes, yeah, but I, that one can sound bigger and stuff. And I went, okay. I, I said, that's easily done, mm -hmm. Amit. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, it was um, partially was like, yeah, I, I feel like working again, you know, and, and I don't want to limit myself. Um, and, and part of it was, the, the, as we know, the, the, the music business changed radically after, you know, Napster. And the, oh, one yeah. of the things that, that changed a lot was there were less and less quote unquote, adult artists. You know, I was more into sophisticated, you know, what I was known for was more the sophisticated kind of stuff. Sure. And they were, they were the first kind of artist to be dropped from major labels. And like, okay, we, you know, those, that kind of sales were, you know, were not the kind of sales they wanted. And the record buying audience of that of those records was aging, and they're buying less records. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, okay, there's less and less of those artists, and <clears throat> and I was unwilling to, frankly, produce do a full production for like small label, a lot of small label stuff. It's just like, God, you know, I, I I'm you're offering me the amount of money to do a whole record that I used to make, you know, in a week, and this is going to take me a month, and it's like, yeah. and, and Part of me wishes I had taken some of those gigs. I was like, yeah, you know, I, I'd rather go and, and uh, drink wine and, and watch basketball games during, during that period. Um, 
So by the time I started being back here in LA in the early 2000s, it's like, okay, I'll do it. You know, and a few guys said, yeah, we're, we'd really like you to do this stuff. And I was, was like, okay, I'm, I'm working, you know, six days a week. I, I kind of don't mind it. Keeps you busy, right? It, it kept me busy. And then mm -hmm. um, when Alan and I decided to do Ocean Way drums, little did I know <laughs> that was going to take me three years. Of, yeah, that turned into a monster, didn't it? Yeah. Um, I, I, I remember telling Phil, Ramon, when, when the product came out and he realized we did it very differently. And I, it was so painstaking. And Phil said to me, God, he said, knowing how anal you are, he said, I, I can't believe you even finished this. You know, it, how long did it take? Because Alan thought, Alan's work on it was like, yeah, it took, you know, a few weeks and a month, you know, and I worked on it for three years because what, what I had to do to, to, to make it work. And, um, you know, and I, it was like, yeah, would I do it again? No. And this was, a, in a sense, a whole new type of project for you also because if you're someone who is really involved in, as you were, seeing the big picture <laughs> all the time, looking at the whole composition, the rooms around everything, and here all of a sudden you're recording Tom hits. Oh shit! In it, isolation, oh. you know, and I—I I mean, that's got to be a completely different change of perspective. Oh, I mean, it—it's it, for anybody that that wants to do it. And and one of my best friends, Andy Norell, the great steel drummer. Um, Andy came to me about five years ago and said, you know, I want to do finally the you know steel drums, a a, a steel drum library like you and Alan did. And I said, I have only one piece of advice for you. Like, it, it, you got to run away from that concept as far away from it. Danger and, Will Robinson. And danger, mm -hmm. danger. And <clears throat> for him, it was, uh, you know, such a labor of love because his specific steel drums, you know, are the best sounding in the world. Mm -hmm. and, and anybody had made sample steel drums. They, they sucked. I mean, they really did suck. And I said, Andy, as long as you're going to do it, just know it's going to take you four to five times longer than, than you thought. Uh -huh. And when he, a few years later, he, uh, I, I met him. Uh, he lived part-time in the Caribbean. And he played me some, something. And I said, yeah, that sounds good. Is that a new record? And he goes, yeah, it could be, but it's all sampled. And I went, fuck, that's amazing. Uh -huh. And it sounded great, but from that point on, even after he had the great sounds, it took him another two and a half, three years to get everything programmed correctly, you know. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, better you than me, my friend. Uh, yeah. And and anybody that that wants to get into the, into these, you, you have to really be, in, you know, absolutely in love with it. Um, and yeah, it was it was difficult, and I. Again, I would never do it again by myself. I mean, uh, there was there was talk for a while about um, Korg wanting me to go to, to Japan and do a piano thing. But the difference with, with piano, there's this, there, I don't know if you know about this, for the sampled piano uh, libraries out there, there's this this machine. It's, it's, yes. it's a robot. It, yes. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to sit there. Like it, it actually plays, it'll play the notes and you can program it to, to hit at, with different lengths and at different uh, velocities. Um, you know, and I said, yeah, if we can use the robot, great, because I'm not sitting there <laughs> fucking ever <laughs> and listening to. Play me a C sharp. <laughs> you know, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, so. Um, that didn't. That project didn't happen, uh, but that was the only way I would have <clears throat> would have gone and, and done another one. It's just it's so interesting to me. As I say, the the dichotomy between your perspective prior to doing that, which was really, as you said, you, you heard the whole thing in your head. You know, you were looking for something that was 
a mix of music and sonic environment, etc., and you were trying to create this cohesive thing, this musical experience. And now here you are. Play me a drum hit. Yeah. Play well, it again. Well, yeah. You know, um, and and what what I wanted to do, and, and Alan and I were both, you know, we wanted to to do something that didn't exist in the real world, mm -hmm. where you could take the ambience from the from the different rooms and go, I can I can put a more room ambience on the kick, but less on on the snare and 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 almost none on the cymbals, so you mm -hmm. don't have the Phil Collins thing of like right. and you and no no one had ever done it. And and that was my joke with Phil, because I went, yeah, if I realized how long it was gonna take to do it like that, I never would have done it. Sure. Sure. It, you know, so um, yeah, it was it was a labor it, it turned out to be a labor of love because we, we needed to finish it and I wanted to see it through. But um, yeah, <laughs> that was that was that was a that was a monster. So after that, were you dying to get back in the studio and just do like a, a solo piano record again? Or? No, <laughs> but I, I, I was I was certainly dying to get back into <clears throat> uh, you know studio and sit with make music m yeah. musicians mm -hmm. and singers and be able to say hey let's let's do another take here and your th those those dotted triplets that you know uh, that you played play this you know and, mm -hmm. and do my thing yeah. as as a as musician a as a producer producer yeah. going mm -hmm. you, you were flat <clears throat> about three cents flat on that note and then you can hold it a little you know do yeah. my thing yeah mm -hmm. um and and i did i did probably a project or two that i wouldn't have done financially uh because it was low money if i hadn't just been wanting to let out you know get the <laughs> hell out of my little studio and, and you know making tiny changes for uh -huh. forever so mm -hmm. so yeah um so that's um yeah that was that was that and um you know again i i talk talk about those relationships you know i think back to when i was introduced to alan it was it was uh, Bernie and um, I was uh, doing a record mastering a record with with Bernie Grumman and um, and Bernie said you know you, you should meet Alan and 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 I had heard of his name again this is 41 or 42 years ago uh -huh. and he had heard of me when I was working with Malcolm Cecil but we didn't connect then uh, and this is right when I mean we're we're, <clears throat> we're sitting, you know, in now the the remaining building with Bill Putnam Studios, and I knew enough from the the older guys like they told me about this building in sixty fifty, going okay th these are the, these are the temples, yep. you know, like once you you know you, you're going to want to record in these rooms, you know. Give me the history oh, of course of of, <clears throat> of Bill and and uh, so Bernie introduces uh, <clears throat> Alan and I and you know and I go wow you know interesting tall guy and and then uh, about a few months later Bernie said I brought Bernie's early stuff of, of Michael Hedges and Bernie said okay Alan has these big speakers he likes to play them really loud <laughs> in Studio A we're gonna go over with with a tape and. And you, we're going to blow him away. And and every, all of us who know Bernie, Bernie's a low key guy, but he had like this almost mischievous thought because the the, the cut of aerial boundaries on the Michael Hedges' record is so dynamic. The beginning is at this level, and then when he hits the guitar, it it goes up like an 18 dB rise. And uh, Bernie knew that Alan was going to turn the, the 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 monitors up really loud at the beginning. And and it was just going to sh you know shock him when, when this 18 dB rise comes up, mm -hmm. and lo and behold, like it did, and and Alan went, oh whoa, you know, oh my God, he said, well, yeah, and wh wh where'd you record this, and where where'd you mix it, and I went, I, I didn't mix it, I, it was actually done in, in in a living room, and I did it in the truck, and it's live to True Track, like that, you didn't mix that, all that reverb stuff, I, yeah, no, and he, and. From that day, Alan and I were like, he said, I, I don't understand. He said, you know, it's, it's different, but wow, you're, as, as he calls it, real. you're my buddy. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, 
you know, and little did I know that, you know, decades later we, you know, be doing that kind of thing, you know, the, the Oceanway drums. And, uh, you know, we, we, I helped Alan build the studio at, in, in the Caribbean. That was, <clears throat> that was a fun project. Um, so, yeah, so those, those relationships, um, you know, uh, God, you know, still know our mutual friend Eric Zolber, who mm -hmm. I went to college with. You know, yep. we're, we're talking now close to 50 years ago. <laughs> it's amazing, really, if you think about it, just the, the connective tissue of our industry, our lives, you know. All of these relationships beget other relationships, and they're all so deeply entwined with our creative and, juices. And I, you know? and, I got, and I must say, I've been really lucky in that I've been part of the New York Los Angeles and San Francisco yeah, scenes. Yeah, you're and, a freak, man. And, and so, you know, <laughs> there, there are those who, you know, uh, uh, meshed, you know, with with more than one. Mm -hmm. Leslie Ann Jones and, and uh, you know, who back and forth. Back and forth, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but I was one of the few still who, you know, there, there were people... When I came back to, to Los Angeles um, full time in 2001, I remember walking down the street in Venice, and there was a guy that I recognized when, when I was working for Malcolm Cecil in, in Venice in 78 and 79. And he went, hey, good to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. And, you know, and it made me think, well, yeah, I, I haven't seen you like 40 you know, it's been like 40 years. Hey, it's still around, and yeah, kind of, kind of the, an amazing thing, you know. And uh, and and it's and that musical, you know, the, the musical brotherhood. You know, I've been part of the, the musicians and the the engineers yeah. and producers. Yeah. And, you know, and and I, I I feel like that brotherhood is important on 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 all levels. You know, and I and I really I like to hang out with. I like to hang out with musicians and producers and engineers, and um, they're my favorite people to hang out with. And outside of that, you know, I, I want people uh, to hang out with that know about professional basketball and wine. <laughs> and, and, and if you know two of those things, like, you know, it's... Uh, we can be friends. We can be friends. Uh -huh. We can be friends for a long time. Uh -huh. um, and that's why uh, the wine group that... Uh, Candice and myself and <clears throat> others partake in is is like it's it's kind of sacred, you know. It's, it's well, you know, it's it's funny because a lot of people outside of our industry see us as sort of one dimensional, you know. Oh, you guys make music, you know, and and you know, you you talk to so many of our friends, and they all have these really disparate kind of interests, like you know. Uh, a couple of guys are pilots, you know, and some people are, are boaters. And, you know, um, it's, it's just such a diverse, you know, all of us who are in this industry, we're, we're all so multifaceted and so, you know, there's like, oh, I didn't know you were into that. There's this whole sort of camaraderie in that sense that I think is... Oh, yeah. And, you know, the other thing is, <clears throat> I think most of us <sighs> realize... You know, we're, we're, you know, I, I, it sounds cliche, and it took me a long time to, to actually 100% feel this. We're blessed because oh, yeah. we get to do something that started out as a love and that most people look at and as an avocation. <clears throat> and if you get to, um, and it, it could be anything that you love that you get to do um, as your career, it, it, it's, it's an amazing thing. And to be in the arts um, and make a living out of it, you know, is... That's such a blessing. I mean, is a blessing, yeah. any kind of living. Absolutely. And then, mm -hmm. you know, and again, I, I think I, I was, I was uh, kind of blinded by the levels of success that I had so early, you know, by, you know, 23, 24, <clears throat> where the, you know these records are that should be selling you know you know 
a hundred of them. You know, they're selling you know half a million of them. Yep. And I, it took me a while to go. Yeah, I am blessed. And um, and also realizing we have fun. You know, one of my good friends, the late guitar player Jeff Golub. Uh, he died, oh my God, at this point, like seven or eight years ago. <clears throat> and as Jeff was, was dying of this awful disease, you know, we said, God, you know, we had fun. You know, and, and he said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not making it, you know, another few months. And he said, I've, I'm, I've lived the, the level of fun that I've had. You know, I, there are people that turned 100 that didn't have this much and, and, it's, and it's the same thing. I feel like, man, you know, we, I mean, talk about c connecting your, your various loves. I mean, I, I get to, you know, be in the studio and I crack open a bottle of wine at noon and I'm drinking bourbon and whiskey, you know, my time <laughs> with, with, with Dave Matthews, which was just funner than shit. You know, we're, we're, we're making music, but then we're, we're cracking open the, the bourbon. We're, we're, I'm, I'm going to the store and buying cases of, of wine. And it's like, yeah, this is, this is fun. Other people doing straight jobs don't have this. And at the same time, I don't know if they get the deep, deep satisfaction. Everybody gets satisfaction when they do a job well. But there's something especially for me being so hands-on with the art. There's so much of me in the records that I've, most of the records that I've made. So I get this deep level of, of satisfaction and gratification of going, yeah, it, it, not only a job well done, but I, I, it's something that I feel like there's, there's value. And, and yes. so um, when you're contributing Record. to somebody else's life. When, when Alan and I would go to uh, Asia and, and do these hi-fi shows with this uh, Oceanway speakers, and someone would come up to me and go, we want you to, to, to speak because, my God, you're, you're, you're the one that did aerial boundaries. You're the one who did, and, and uh, you're the guy who did this, and, and the, these are audiophile records, and... And I'm going, wow, that's 30, 40 years ago. Well, that's, that's kind of cool. Yeah. That's, that's kind of cool. So there is a level of, of gratification. Um, and, and pride. And pride. No and, mm -hmm. and it's like, yeah. you know, and bring a good bottle of wine into the, into the, the deal. And it's like, you can't lose. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 um, I feel, I do feel fortunate. I feel blessed to have, you know, had... All those different things, you know, and, and even having, you know, worked with Robert De Niro in, in hysterical situations. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, one, one of the funniest, literally, I think one of the funniest studio situations I ever had was with Robert De Niro. He, he directed, I don't know if Robert's ever directed another movie, but uh, this movie was called Bronx Tale. Uh -huh. And it was about, it was a great great uh, play that became a movie. And we were doing the main theme, which was a, um, a group, you know, an a cappella group, doing doo-wop, doo on the streets of the Bronx, doo <laughs> And Robert had seen these young guys at like a, a restaurant up in Arthur Avenue, up in the Bronx, and brought these young guys to Sear Sound. It was a Sunday night, a rainy Sunday night. And as soon as I heard these guys, I knew they weren't pros. And it was like, oh, this is going to be difficult. And I set up a C24. For people that don't know, it's one a of the rarest, mic. rarest mics. It's mm -hmm. C12s, but stereo. Yep. And I thought, OK, I want a stereo mic, and it's going to be a tube, and it's going to sound great. You know. And I'm working with these guys. And it's not going all that well. But suddenly, out of the blue, I'm here, and we're hearing the radios of cabs, of radio dispatchers, and we're getting RF on, onto the, wow. the, the C24. Yikes. I'm going, and De Niro's looking at me, and I'm, you know, I, what? Right. And I go, and I told Robert, this is the Rolls Royce of mics. So I said, well, I should change it. He goes, 
No, it's the Rolls Royce of mics. I don't want to go for the Cadillac of mics. Yeah. So I had the assistant go out and grab the, the cable to the power supply, walk around, and he found a place where uh, the RF stopped. I said, okay, so now we're going to have to figure out like, how to do that. And De Niro said to me, what do you mean? I said, what do you, what do you mean? He said, the kid standing there, it stopped. Just have the kid stand there. I said, <laughs> Bob, I can't have the guy stand a foot away from the singers Holding the thing, it's it's like the 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 guy, the Russian you know weightlifter who's in the Olympics. He he can't just stand. Why not? I don't know. But he, he, I got guys grips on films. They do stuff like this. I go no 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 no. I said I got to get another mic. He goes so you get another one of these mics. I said it's a rainy Sunday night in New York City. There's there's no one. There's only like two or three of these mics also in New York City. You. Go, I, you know, we're going to have to do another but No, he said, you're going to have to have the kid stand there. So I said, all right. What about a mic stand? Well, I, I, we tried to do that. Anyway, okay. well, I'm going to give the, the short version of the rest of the story. So I said, Bob, why don't you take the guys, go out maybe, like, I, I, I need, I, I want to set up a, another mic just in case, even though the guy's going to stand there, that the uh, if the other mic stops working. So with the assistant, I quickly set up other mics. I said, okay, we know this is going to, the, the, the C12 is going to fuck up, the C24. So I had the assistant switch the other input, the mic, the other oh. input into where the C24 <laughs> was. So I, because De Niro is smart. So if he looked, it would be like, well, no, we're using that mic. And I, 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 without even the guys in there, I, I, I evened out what I thought the mic pre's would be so there wouldn't be a, b a big level change. I said, all right, come back in. And I had to work with the guys. And, and I'm, you know, recording, and I'm recording just live, this live to that. I, I, I should have been recording multi-track, but the whole deal was going to be, I got two tracks. I'm just recording live to that. Then I send them out, actually, to dinner. So I could edit because they were. The, I needed to edit, so I needed to take the stuff from that to half track, edit the stuff, and then put it back to that. So they come back from dinner, and I said, "Okay, here it is." And he goes, "See, see, Mr. Music Genius, I know things." He said, "I knew that mic would work, and I knew like that you'd find a take that was because I said, Bob." I, there's not a single take that's going to work. I've got to edit stuff. He goes, I, I know there's a good take. I, I've been listening. So when he came, he goes, see, I knew it. And I, and I said to the assistant after Bob left, I said, you just got to sometimes do whatever works. I said, he came away thinking <coughs> he knew best. I just said, we've got we've to make the session happen. It's got to work because I can't send these bad takes to the music editor. He's not going to know what to do with it. I need to have Bob walk out of there with something that's not clicking. And, it's, and you know, and I never told De Niro. Like it, so it, ultimately, you did not use the C24, and you did not have a single take. You had it all edited. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah. that mic, yep. that, that's the Rolls yep. Royce. That's why you got me the Rolls Royce. And the kid did a good job holding it. <laughs> This poor kid is probably... And I almost told Bob at, at the premiere of the movie, and then <clears throat> uh, someone said, you know, I think better left unsaid. He's going to know now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think De Niro's going to be watching this. <laughs> hey, you never know. I could call his management and let him know to watch yeah. this. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things, you know. I love it. It's yes. always good to have fun. You have had a, a charmed career, to be sure. Yeah. It has been. Mm -hmm. And so now you are um, basically going to spend time drinking wine and uh, being a wine connoisseur or going to open a vineyard? You know, we had, <laughs> that, that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, no, at, at this point, I'm, I'm smart enough at this point not to. Um, that's some thankless work. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, 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 I love going to vineyards and love visiting. And uh, uh, there, there was... Uh, 
and, and there was a whole story with Wyndham Hill Wine, uh -huh. which was a, uh, a, a uh, endeavor that was uh, not well planned, let's just say. I see. There was Wyndham Hill Wine that was sold in Japan. Um, oh. Um, let's just say um, for our, uh, our friends who speak Yiddish, it was Pishaks, <laughs> which means piss. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so um, no, that that's not something. I, I think the drinking of the wine, you know, is is like it's like Jerry Seinfeld. The holding of the wine is is good. The holding of the wine is good. I like the holding, but what better is the drinking? I think the drinking is better than the holding. Mm -hmm. The acquiring is nice. The holding is is nicer. The drinking. It's the best, you know. But the growing the grapes and all that stuff, not, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, you know. What's that old saying about, uh, it's an old Shakespeare line, uh, he who appreciates great sausage and the law should never watch either being made. <laughs> <laughs> Probably applies to wine, too. Well, yeah, and, and, and especially, you know, just, just the thought of, of, of Lucy and, you know, mm -hmm. and Lucy and Ethel, like, there you ma go. mashing yeah. the grapes. It's like, yeah, okay. Of course, I, th I think it applies to the making of music sometimes, too, you know. It's like a lot of people don't necessarily realize all of the, uh, everything that goes into making a record like that. It's yeah, it's just so different. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, wine and, uh, I would say, bourbon and scotch and, well, mezcal for that. I might as well throw in some mezcal. Okay. Some some añejo tequila. You know, th those are those are fine accoutrements. Sounds <laughs> like you've got your hands full. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen Miller, thank you for being my guest. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Hey, I'm Daniel Keller. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and join us each week for insights and sound. So should I face this way or, <clears throat> or? Well, it's up to you. Do you normally look away from people when you're talking to them? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, well, it's all like social mores, you know. So I mean, like, you know, whatever works for you, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm good, you know. Well, so. um, 